Good afternoon and welcome to the 10th annual Regulators and Policymakers Retreat held by IPPI and Aviation Watch. With me is Alan Leibson of the US Stimson Center, a leading think tank in the US and uh, she has a distinguished record of uh, 25 years of public service. Welcome to the show, Alin. Thank you. Alin, we'd like to know, you made a brilliant presentation, a brilliant speech at the conference right now. And we wanted to know, uh, given the current economic situation, you know, emergency situations call for emergency measures. So what sort of changing of the uh, economic scenario or of the way the polity in the US deals with the economics, the political economic relationships you know, with private mm -hmm. players, government players, their relationships, how has it been affected or changed in the current uh, emergency economic situation? Well, as you know, the United States has always been one of the most enthusiastic proponents of the capitalist system and believes that markets can bring economic growth and prosperity and we've always had uh, one of the most dynamic and innovative private sectors that wants as much freedom as possible from government. Um, but I think people are quite shaken right now of whether there were some real structural flaws in the system. We have a series of regulatory commissions, for example, the Securities and Exchange Commission that follows the uh, stock market and parts of the banking system, and I think there is a perception that those regulatory bodies uh, did not perform their, their tasks, that they should have been warning um, uh, the government that there were some problems with the banking system. So we've now had this rather extraordinary period of government intervention in the, the banking system and even in some of the uh, key sectors of the real economy, such as the automobile industry. Most of us think that these are temporary measures and that as soon as the economy stabilizes, and I think most of us believe it will, that the U.S. will get out of this economic crisis, I expect that the government will then want to retreat again. I do not see the U.S. government as wanting to play on a permanent basis um, a different role in controlling economic activity. Some people think this is um, perhaps secretly part of President Obama's agenda to involve the government in the economic activity much more deeply, but I think that is uh, a political position and not the, his true intention. I think his intention is um, after the stimulus package, which has injected a lot of capital into the economy uh, when the banks uh, get on their feet again, perhaps with some stricter regulations, that we will go back to being a, very much a capitalist country again. Great. So does this mean that the U.S. Uh, is in fact ready to be big brother to the private sector, to guide it and then to let go? Does it happen that way that the bureaucracy is always ready to give up its role once it has expanded its role? Well, I don't think it's natural for the uh, U.S. government to be trying to tell the auto industry how many cars it should produce or what kinds of cars it should produce, etc. So I think that people feel that what we're in now is quite an anomalous situation and it should be for just a temporary period and then we should go back to allowing the private sector to be innovative, entrepreneurial, and make its own choices based on what the market will bear. At this point, there are, you know, there's more than one public policy interest. One interest is simply to keep jobs, uh, to protect jobs. Right. So we intervene to artificially support the automobile industry because there's tens of thousands of jobs at stake. So that's the motivation. The motivation is not that we suddenly have changed our minds and want the government to run the automobile industry. It's, it's to achieve some other public good and that once the auto industry has restructured and they will have to stop making big cars, they'll have to refine their idea of where can they make money, where can they be most productive, then I think we'll go back to uh, the previous environment. Although, certainly the regulations on the banking industry have to be looked at carefully and I think that some of the regulators did not perform their function very well. Is it possible then for the government to be actually entrepreneurial in nature? For example, there are certain things like NASA, to have a space program to send men on the moon, to do things, explore Jupiter for example. 
is it possible for the government, uh, for a federal government or for state governments to be actually entrepreneurial and uh, you know, uh, do things that private sector cannot do but has to be done in any case? Well, I think a lot of the big technological breakthroughs of the 20th century were in fact um, stimulated by investments by the federal government. So space is one good example. I think that maybe the push for renewable energy will be another place where the government wants this to create conditions for the natural kind of innovation and entrepreneurial spirit to take place, but it realizes that it has to put in some of the seed money at the beginning, that it does an initial investment. Uh, now, space, I would say, you know, we've never made space economically viable. Space, you know, exploration of space has become a purely governmental function. We've not, uh, with the exception of a few millionaires who've paid to go up for a ride by themselves, there's no economic revenue that's generated by space other than satellites that commercial uh, uh, entities uh, need. But space, so the exploration of space, I would say, is in its own category. But some of the other ways in which the government stimulates entrepreneurial, it enables entrepreneurial activity are just for that startup period. Like renewable energies, I think, will have to then prove that they can uh, make money in the marketplace to survive. Right. Uh, given your 25 years of public service in the US and uh, your years with the Stimson Center, we'd like to know uh, what are your views on the changing Indo-US relationships, economic, social, mm -hmm. political? Well, I had the pleasure of serving in the Clinton White House at one of those early moments where US-Indian relations uh, took off and I was uh, deeply involved in the visit of Prime Minister Rao uh, when he uh, helped, I helped organize, I was working at the White House at the time and I helped organize that meeting. At the time I remember that we wanted to engage with our Indian counterparts to talk about global problems not just uh, India, Pakistan or India in the region. And the Indians at the time were saying we, we want to be a global actor but really the only thing they were focused on was the relationship with Pakistan. Now that has changed, and I think that India really has started to demonstrate more of a leadership role as a, as a responsible global actor, that India can influence the positions of the South on climate change, it can be you know, a model for uh, how you know, economic growth in a, in a country that has transitioned to believe in economic reform. So I think it's very exciting. Now there are always going to be issues in which we don't see eye to eye. I think that there are both immediate issues in India's neighborhood, but um, you know I think that nuclear cooperation with India is still controversial in the United States uh, because we have made this exception for India uh, with respect to its non-membership in the non-proliferation treaty. So there are some policy disputes that are that where there's not 100% consensus in favor of uh, we don't want to make exceptions for India we want India to to demonstrate its own um, success and talent and be a, a partner of the United States I think on the Indian side there are people who don't want to be too close to the United States they want to preserve India's freedom of, of maneuver they want India to set its own course and not be seen as the partner of the United States. But in general, the trajectory is extremely positive and very exciting.